it works. It does. Actually, Dr. Hunter, you can go ahead and start it. I'm just going to go ahead and start it. Okay. And then you can put that mic on. Welcome and uh, happy lunch hour. This is uh, my honor to provide a welcome on behalf of the LGBT Center. My name is uh, Diane Harper. I'm the Chair of Family and Geriatric Medicine. Um, and am an incredibly lucky chair of family medicine to have two of my faculty people who are very interested in making sure that the very best care gets provided to LGBT patients. And so I'm incredibly proud of Dr. Kaloya, who's here, and Dr. Pendleton, who could not be here um, because of clinic responsibilities. Um, the, I think there's a, a groundswell from the community about being able to provide appropriate health care services. To give you a little bit about my background, I was spent about 15 years in New Hampshire. Um, we did Out in the Woods, uh, was an outreach clinic to our gay men and also to our lesbian women. There was a very high incidence of breast cancer in our lesbian population and um, they came saying we have a cry for a need. Our women are unable to hear the need for mammography and therefore are developing breast cancer at a much higher rate than the general population. And so it became very clear to me that being able to get healthcare messages out to everyone regardless of gender identity is incredibly important. And so at just this past year, within the last six months, uh, a group said, let's try to develop this clinic for all of our community that we have here at UofL that we offer. And we are in the process of doing that. I will say right now that we have some very engaged providers, including Dr. Kalea and Dr. Pendleton, as well as our pediatric endocrinologist, as well as some of our social workers. Um, and we are in the process of trying to figure out how to bring this together. Initially, it may not be all under one roof. Initially, it may be just letting you know which office spaces are available. Um, but we are working on that. We're working on concepts and ideas of a navigator who will talk not only about your health care issues, but about what else do you need in order to access the health care system and health care medicines. So I think that um, those are exciting um, venues and exciting um, uh, advancements that we're moving to move the clinical services forward in that. But what we really want to hear about is Dr. Abby. I'll get to that in a moment. <laughs> um, the Equality Steering Committee has done a really good job at trying to reach out and understand what the needs of the community are. And they have surveyed the Louisville community members to understand their priorities for improvements in transgender health care. These results are now published on the LGBT Center's Facebook website. So we're going to provide them electronically in safe paper. You're not going to have a copy of it, but you can pull it up on Facebook and look at those. Um, the name of the survey is Priorities for Transgender Healthcare, um, and that will be easy for you to click on. All right. Dr. Abby. Dr. Abby Beecham is an associate professor at Xavier University. She completed her PhD in clinical psychology at the University of Louisville. Her internship in clinical and health psychology at the University of Florida Health Sciences Center and her postdoctoral fellowship in psycho-oncology and chronic pain management at the University of Kentucky College of Medicine. One of Dr. Beecham's areas of study is in primary care psychology where she's been involved as an educator and a trainer in integrated primary care settings for over a decade. In 2014, she was appointed to and served on the American Psychological Association Presidential Task Force for the Patient-Centered Medical Home. Dr. Beecham's most recent efforts are in the study of the experience of the LGBTQ 
acute patients in medical homes. So with that, we welcome you. First, I want to introduce uh, our panel um, and think of us as an interprofessional team. So I'm going to work uh, first from the outside and work in. Um, Dr. Gay Boffman uh, is a clinical associate or clinical professor in the Department of General Dentistry and Oral Medicine. She's a course director for the introduction uh, to clinical dentistry one and is a D4 group manager. Dr. Boffman is a 1981 graduate of the University of Louisville School of Dentistry. So it's, you know, you can tell there's a consistent thread. We, we you know. Um, before becoming faculty at the dental school in 2009, she was in private practice in Fairdale, Kentucky. Dr. Boffman was also a co-author of a recently published peer review article in October 2015 issue of Journal of Dental Education. Journal of Dental Education titled Perspectives, New Dental Accreditation Standard on Critical Thinking, A Call for Learning Models, Outcomes, and Assessments. To her right is Elwood Stroder, uh, who is currently the co-director of the University of Louisville's 550 Clinic Care Coordinator Program. The 550 Clinic provides psychosocial and medical services for persons with HIV AIDS. Before his current position, Elwood was a medical case manager with Volunteers of America, providing educational, medical, and outreach services to HIV AIDS community. For 30 years, Elwood also worked at the Louisville Metro Department of Health and Wellness in the laboratory, first as a lab tech, then as a supervisor. Where he first became active in public health services, Elwood additionally holds a BS in biology from Western Kentucky University, combining his many years of experience with clinical understanding of special populations. Jaden Tai, uh, you have your master's right now in, uh, you're in counseling psychology, correct? We, we, have, we connect, uh, we're both in psychology. Um, he's a founding member of T-STAR, is that correct? A queer and trans activist, researcher, and scholar. Jaden earned his master's of education in counseling psychology from the University of Louisville and is currently pursuing his doctorate in counseling psychology. His other research and social justice advocacy interests relate to cultural identity development, multiculturalism, communities of color, mental health, and queer and transgender communities, especially queer and transgender Asians, Asian American, and Pacific Islanders. Jaden's understanding of the intersectionality of race, ethnicity, social class, gender, and sexuality, sexuality shapes his approach to activism and social justice, which seeks to raise understanding and awareness of privileges, biases, and empower all voices in our communities to share and honor their narratives and truths. When he's not working to end just injustice in the world, Jaden enjoys rock climbing, spoiling his cats, and all things Doctor Who. Dr. Lori Kaloya, is that correct? I just want to make sure I pronounce names. Is a board certified family physician and assistant professor in the Department of Family and Geriatric Medicine. She received her medical degree from Michigan State University College of Human Medicine in 2004 and completed her family medicine residency at Virginia Commonwealth University Fairfax Family Practice in 2013. There she also completed a leadership certificate in public health through Eastern Virginia Medical School and had substantial experience with quality improvement and patient-centered medical home as a member of the Improvement Cubed I3 Collaborative, which focused on population health, improving patient access to care, reducing unnecessary health care costs, and improving patient experience. She became interested in LGBT health care while working as a clinical provider at Campus Health and has interest in improving health care services in this patient population. I can say, you know, I'm the outsider coming in. I work at Xavier University. And the interprofessional perspective that is all the buzz in the community is a reality here for LGBT health care. And this is an extraordinary um, effort on the, for U of L and all around the region, if not across the country. Um, so I was really thrilled to be able to come here. And in just a minute, I'll shut up. My job is to set the stage and facilitate questions among our panelists. What I wanted to do in terms of facilitating um, or setting the stage is talk just very briefly about why did I even come to this. My background is in patient-centered medical home. I train psychologists to work in medical settings. 
and in dentistry. And um, patient-centered medical homes is an area of research for me and has been for a while. I identify as gay, and um, I really put that out to the side, on the back burner, until, uh, in terms of my professional work, until I had my own health care concern. And I was working in the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Colorado, and um, as one does, I saw my primary care provider in that department, and um, my experience uh, culminated in a number of things, as you can see on your screen. That's me. That's what it culminated in. Um, and that's one of those pictures that ends up on Facebook that you didn't know was taken. Um, <laughs> I said, what? How did, you never took that picture. That was after my Versed, all was well in the world. Um, but my journey to that moment woke me up. It wiped my windshield in a big way because I delayed my care. I didn't have a primary care provider that I felt comfortable with or trusted. And I needed to have some surgery and it was gynecological of nature. And at one point in this very long process, someone said to me, well, you don't need it. You're not, you don't need a uterus. You're not going to use it. You're gay. And I thought, oh, that just doesn't feel right to me. And so I delayed care longer. And I delayed care to the point where I didn't know what to do. And somebody in Colorado said to me, there is a doctor in Cincinnati, Ohio, who is really good at the problem you're having, and she, her practice is LGBT friendly, and you're going to love her. And so what I did was I got together my own money, and psychologists don't make a ton of money. I flew across the country to see this doctor because I felt I would feel at home. And I ended up coming to Cincinnati and working in Cincinnati and ultimately having a surgery that I needed in Cincinnati. Now, that experience, I have resources and I have knowledge and I work in this area, and I thought, my goodness, if I have this kind of apprehension and this kind of anxiety, how does it feel for others? So that's what brought me to this work, and some colleagues and I are now working on an article, uh, the Patient-Centered Medical Home is there a welcome mat for LGBT? So coming to you today, uh, what we're trying to do is talk about team-based care. Talk about the medical community and how the patient-centered medical home is really vital for this community. And within interprofessional teams, we have uh, behavioral health. Uh, we have dentistry. We have people who are working in public health care coordination and physicians and other primary care providers who can come together to provide the best, most welcoming care. Um, the, whoops, this is a dandy device. Uh, there we go. <laughs> uh, I have a couple of definitions, one from the World Health Organization uh, as an operational definition. But essentially, interprofessional teamwork is the way that we can come to together to provide the best care for our patients seamlessly each bringing something to their care that will enhance the experience and enhance outcomes. Now, here's the love slide. This is the medical community, the medical neighborhood. And within the medical neighborhood, you can see that the, all of the arrows converge in one place, which we could think of as a medical home. And this may be specialty clinics. It may be off-site referral sources. It may be people within the clinic. It may be a physical space, or it may be a spirit of care. Because a patient-centered medical home doesn't necessarily always have to be a physical space, but it is the spirit of finding a home where a person feels comfortable, embraced, and valued as a patient, and everything is coordinated to meet their needs. So. What we've done is assembled a panel, uh, a very excellent panel, and I'm going to be fielding the questions and we'll pass the microphone. First, we'll have questions that have been prepared for each of them to address, and then we'll be stopping at a certain point to get questions from the group. So um, what I wanted to do uh, is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with Jaden, if I may. 
Are you ready? This is work. Okay, and then I'm going to I'm going to sit down. So I'm going to disappear. <laughs> okay. Um, we often use the term LGBT affirming to describe medical professionals and organizations that are both trained to provide competent and caring care. What specifically, if you think of yourself as, as a health professional, um, what within your practice, what do you do or what do you look for to be LGBT affirming? And then I'm going to move through the group with the same question. So can, can people hear me? Okay. So I'm part of an organization called TSTAR, which stands for Transsexuality Advocacy and Research. And what we do is actually go around um, training healthcare professionals, mental health professionals, medical health professionals, um, community members on how to be trans affirming. Uh, not or really just how to be affirming to LGBT folks in general, but specifically for trans folks. And as a m mental health provider, um, it's what I often see uh, lacking is that we don't hold ourselves accountable. That we, when we don't know something, we fail to acknowledge it, and we fail to acknowledge it with our uh, clients or with our patients. And we often fail to understand the community, the language, the, the discourse that's being had in the community, and why it's so important how that affects each person and how they interact with the medical and mental health community. And so what I do um, as a part of TSAR, but not only as a part of TSAR, but also as part of the mental health community, is that we go out and we train, we teach people what are up-to-date languages and terminology that's used in the community. Because I don't know if folks know, but the terms and te uh, terminology and definitions and the language that we use in the trans community changes very often. I wrote a a manuscript one year and I had to go back and change the terminology completely the next year for resubmission because the language changed so much. And so we make sure that folks are up to date on the language. We make sure that folks are up to date on their understanding of the constructs of these um, terminology and how that relates to trans folks and queer folks. But also how to, for lack of better words, how to not be douchebags. Right, so there's there's this overlying way. There's a general way to treat people with affirmation and validation and respect. It's basic level. We, you don't even need to know all that much about the community to just treat people with respect. So that's usually where we start. We make sure that they get a foundation because you can't go anywhere without foundation and the fundamentals. And then we slowly build them up from there, and then go into more advanced stuff on. You know, what does things even mean for that particular person? What do specific communities, sub-communities within the community look like? But you can't even get there unless you even know how to talk to them. So what we do is really train people on how to just talk to people in a respectful manner and at the same time validate their identities. So, um, Elwood, we're going to have you address the same question. And so let me just... I'll refresh your memory on the question. And um, we, we use the term LGBT affirming. Um, what specifically do you do as a health professional and within the work that you do to be LGBT affirming? Well, actually, I think, can you hear me? I think we're a little ahead of the curve because of the work we do doing HIV social services. Um, we, our staff demographic, we've made sure that it actually mirrors our patient demographic. So we have a, a, a wide variety and diversity in our staff. Um, we also, all of our intake documents, our agency forms, they all reflect LGBTQ uh, sensitivity. And, it, and to piggyback on what Jaden said, we also, everyone who comes in our office gets treated with respect and gets treated with dignity and especially non-judgmental. We don't like to be judgmental at all. It's very important for us. Our clients come to us with all varying backgrounds and to be non-judgmental, to get them the services that we need, um, we need to be non respectful, non-judgmental, and also um, very res to to actually respect their dignity. So that's what we do. No, can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, people who attend the certificate. 
program sessions, one, to provide great care to LGBT persons, and often they feel worried that they'll misstep and offend a patient who will not have the full information or skills, which is exactly what um, Jaden and Edward were referring to. Um, share a time, if you would, when you realize that you took a misstep or bumped up against a limitation in providing care that you learned and what you learned from this experience. So. I think I can say safely that unfortunately this is something that will occur frequently as you go on um, and I am constantly learning from my mistakes and the mistakes of those around me. Um, I think I came into LGBT healthcare um, fairly naive and I was actually fortunate enough to have done the training that um, Jaden's T-Star lab had provided and that was really helpful to me. Um, it was definitely eye-opening to see how um, coming into a situation as a white um, uh, female that identifies as heterosexual, how I bring a lot to the table of my own biases, even um, unintentionally. And so I think anything that we can do to help address our own biases, whether we know we have them or not, is really important. Um, when it comes to missteps that occur in the clinic, I think frequent things that um, I have run into and have tried to take extra steps to try to prevent in the future have been um, one thing that occurs frequently is misgendering of patients. Um, some of that has to do with difficulties with identification and um, electronic medical record systems. So our electronic medical record system we're working on and now we have M, F, and I. So at least we have something that will uh, let someone recognize that a person may not be male or female on that binary gender scale. Um, we, I also personally take the time every day I do this, I look at my schedule ahead of time and I will actually go to all of my staff and say, you know, so-and-so is coming in today, this is how they identify, this is their proper name that you should be using so that I can make sure that my patients are not misgendered when they come to the front desk. Um, so I think those are s small things, but they, they make a big difference. Um, I think um, part of why I've hopefully been fairly successful at doing this is because I did bring to the table, I feel like, a, a respect for all of my patients. And with that respect, I am constantly trying to do more and more to learn how to better take care of the LGBT population. So there's a lot of resources we'll give you. Um, I think there's a handout with that, but um, I. Every other uh, week I'll be at home watching TV and I'll have my computer pulled up with a Fenway Health um, training session and watch an hour of one more thing that I might be able to learn something else about how to provide better care for LGBT, um, for the LGBT population and my patients that I see. So I think those are just small things and small examples. Um, I think when errors are made, um, you have to be not afraid to say that was a mistake, whether I made the mistake, whether my staff made the mistake. Um, I think it means a lot to your patient when the mistake occurs that someone recognizes that and that they say, you know what, we're going to try to do something to make this better and, and so it doesn't happen the next time. Yeah, and give feedback to, to staff or, you know, ask for feedback too from patients and say, you know what, I totally botched that. Is there something I could do better? Do you have, you know, how, how can I make this situation better for the next time? So, I think um, as someone, I'm going to go down here to Gay in just a second. Uh, as someone who's a member of the community, I, I am, I'm a goofball and I tend to mishandle a lot of things clinically. I, not everything. I, I, I am competent in some areas, but um, <laughs> I, as a member of the LGBT community, I identify as gay, and I, I don't use the term lesbian, and, and because I've just never been comfortable with it, it's not how I identify. But in having conversations where someone can, you know, is insistent on saying I'm lesbian, I'm lesbian, is exactly what you're talking about, um, and I have misgendered people um, that just because I am part of the community, I feel equally awkward at times because I, the terms change. Like, they're probably changing as we're sitting here. We should all go look. Um, so I, I think it's important uh, that we not have to feel perfect and that we feel, uh, have license to mishandle or step in things or, or learn. Um, yeah, Jade, yeah. 
So uh, that resonates a lot with me, like the humility part. So I identify as trans, so I'm a part of the community, and I'm part of the mental health community, and I still mess up, <laughs> right? I, I, too, have misgendered folks. Like, hell, I misgendered myself before, which is really <laughs> weird, really <laughs> weird in front of, like, a ton of people. But that happens, and that's where it's important for us to get over our own egos, to acknowledge that we, too, mess up, that it's okay – to have feedback it doesn't mean that we're any worse or any better it just means that we acknowledge our power differential in the room because as professionals and with clients there's a massive power differential there's a huge power dynamic and that really affects the patient and the client so for us to work collaboratively with the client and show that we're not perfect but we want to help you regardless how can we do that so it's that mutual respect, that collaboration for anyone, no matter how you identify, that's equally important across the board. Sorry. So one of the conversations that um, Gay and I had when we were waiting outside uh, was, you know, we're talking about improving access to care. And access to care um, has to do with where pa our patients feel most comfortable, where they enter the door, and um, so we were talking about dentistry and how dentistry intuitively makes a lot of sense because often people who are loath to go to the doctor, no offense, who are loath to go to the doctor will actually end up in a dentist office and how the dentist office can become a hub. Um, so our third question, which we wanted you to address, how and when do you currently involve other healthcare professionals or community resources to provide an experience of wraparound, patient-centered medical home, patient-centered care for LGBT patients? I think we have a very unique opportunity as dentists because we see people that will not darken the door, sorry again, of the physician's office. And sometimes we're the first people that takes a blood pressure, the first people, person that sees some type of an oral lesion because people will come to us that go nowhere else because they just can't stand the, the toothache. And I'm going to have to go back because we were talking about missteps too and I see some of my dental students out here and critical thinking, okay everybody knows that's my thing, is critical thinking and we talked about humility and in the dental setting and uh, thinking because we, we uh, try very hard uh, deliberately to incorporate unconscious bias into our curriculum as in the introduction to clinical dentistry one. And the misstep, I'm gonna share quickly because I know we're to the next question, but um, I felt like, you know, I'm teaching this and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the teacher so I should know all these things and I don't. And I walk into the clinic and there is a gentleman sitting there. He looks like grandpa the perfect grandpa and he's showing me pictures of his grandchildren and we just talk we just chat and then I go to his health history he's HIV positive and I thought I teach these things and I'm sitting there thinking well how did he get that and I thought I cannot believe these thoughts went through my head that I'm teaching these things and trying to be a model to all these wonderful young people I see Julia there these wonderful young people but um, because we are, the, sometimes we will see the people that nobody else, and I want everyone to feel very welcome. Going to the dentist is scary enough and uh, to feel quite welcome. But the missteps, I still, it was very humbling. I want to, I know we've gone on to the next question, but I also want to make sure that each panelist has an opportunity to address. And El, what I wanted to, reference you with respect to any kind of missteps or when in looking back some things not that you have to tell you don't have to tell, tell something well, good we, or <laughs> well, we, we've all had missteps misgendering someone is very something is especially on their appearance when they walk in you immediately make an assumption and that may not be how that person identifies so you have to make sure that you don't misgender someone just from their appearance um, my limitations, especially when I began this work, were vocabulary related, very much so. And, I, and it changes continuously, and I still make mistakes. And luckily, I have a staff. Our staff is, is very diverse, and 
if if you ask questions respectfully of your patient, you're usually going to get the the answer. Um, that's it. They're usually willing and able and wanting to answer your questions if you ask them with sensitivity and caring and with respect. They're always willing to answer those questions. So, One of the things that we're going to turn to right now is having other disciplines become part of a patient's care. And so I'll start with you, Lori, um, and then we can extend uh, because we have time, and I want to make sure that we uh, are able to share everybody's expertise. Can you describe a case in which you were unable to provide wraparound care and explain how you would have liked, in an ideal world, that model of care to look like? So I think this, um, as, as I know, there's no perfect patient-centered medical home out there. I have an, in an ideal world. Um, to me, what this would look like is someone comes into a welcoming environment, um, they have someone greet them at the door of the clinic. They help them get checked in. Um, they use appropriate terminology and inclusive language as they're um, checking in the patient. They have the correct name and gender identification in our computer. Um, so there's no missteps in that part of things. Um, they get checked in by our compassionate and caring medical staff. Um, they get to see me and they're happy to see me because they had a good experience going up to that and we address their medical issues. Um, we help them schedule their referrals and their, get their lab work done and radiology testing done. Um, and we get them set up with other support, so social workers to help connect them with community resources, um, referrals to our um, friendly dentists if they need dental care, um, some places actually have dental um, services within their own offices. Um, other things like physical therapy, um, behavioral health services, um, those things, you know, the more you can provide all of that in one place, the, the better care you can provide because you can literally take someone by the hand and walk them to each place. Um, I think we often fail in this, um, and, and time can be a major barrier for us, as well as finances, I think, are, tend to be the other thing. So we have these two major barriers. Um, and so often I have trouble getting patients in to see me. They have barriers just getting um, into, make, getting through the phone line to make an appointment with me. And when they get through the phone line to make an appointment with me, I may not have an appointment available. So I think things that I do is I try to go the extra step as a provider. And once someone's gotten in to see me, I say, you know what, if we can find some way to connect, if you're having those barriers, please, you know, send me an email, um, sign up for our patient portal so that you can get in touch with me about medical concerns you may have that I can correspond with you after hours if I'm in the middle of patient care or I'm not doing patient care that day. Um, so, so those sorts of things can help um, kind of connect you to your patient and continue to provide the services they need, even if it's not in a perfect um, setting. Um, other things, I think that we, um, Dr. Harper mentioned the idea of a, of a patient navigator, and I've uh, read about this in other settings where, um, particularly in LGBT clinics, they have um, a diverse population, often trying to mirror the, the patient population that provides navigation um, for patients. So many of our LGBT patients don't want to go and have an ultrasound done because they're afraid, frankly, of the way that ultrasound technician may treat them or how they'll be treated when they check in at the radiology department. So having someone that may help them negotiate that um, and advocate for them so that they're not having to be their own advocate and a patient at the same time um, is certainly a model that would be ideal. So. Others who want to address this question? Yeah. I will briefly, and actually what you were speaking of, because I, don't always, I do not always feel like it's an easy avenue, and I think sometimes people get a little lost and they're already a bit uncomfortable, and I think us sitting here is, is a very positive because I have not always felt the clear path. Okay. I know that we actually... We do a lot of wraparound services. We, we have legal aid come to our offices once a week. We have the dental school comes and does dental screenings once a week. Um, we partner with a lot of other aid service organizations for food, 
uh, for housing. We partner with Walgreens uh, for medication assistance. We do a lot of different partnering. The, the main two things that we run into problems with are housing and mental health treatment. Continuously, we, a lot of our clients come to us on mental health meds. Our providers at the clinic do HIV care. They're not comfortable providing um, mental health care or, or mental health or even prescribing, writing prescriptions. They're just not, that's not their thing and that's not what they do. And so we have such trouble finding any kind of mental health treatment for someone who actually needs some, a, a prescription and to actually do medication management and to do assessments. Uh, we just can't find that, and, and it's just horrible. And as far as housing goes, we, it's, a lot of our LGBTQ clients who need housing don't feel safe going to a shelter, um, especially our trans clients. If they go to a shelter, they identify as female, they go to a shelter, they ask them for their ID. Their ID may say male on it. They're going to house them with the males regardless of their appearance. It's a very dangerous situation for them. Um, that's the kind of thing that, that we have trouble with. And in an ideal world, I would think there would be much more housing and much more mental health treatment that would be available. I think interprofessionally, we just don't talk to each other. The resources are out there, but we just don't talk to each other. And that's the problem when all these resources are scattered and not in a central hub or in a, in a, a central locale. So I, I work with trans clients, and I hear stories about how afraid they are to reach out for uh, any kind of mental health services or any kind of community services in general because of safety concerns, of um, traumatic experiences. So for me to hear that my own community is experiencing trauma from the medical community or even the other mental health professors, that's, that's disconcerting because these are the communities that are supposed to help folks. But when they're being traumatized, when they're not getting the care that they need, when they go thinking that it's a safe place and it's not, we're only re-traumatizing our patients and our clients if we're not careful. And when it's in a central hub, there's some quality control. We can say, we can walk across the hallway or across the building and have conversations. But when I see my clients and they need medical care or they need an endocrinologist, I don't know who are, who's safe out there for them. I don't know, I don't wanna put them in a situation that's just gonna re-traumatize them and then they come back and then they don't trust anyone. I don't wanna cause more harm that's, that's already been done. And so for me to try to risk their mental well-being so they can get medical help and not know if that medical help is safe, I can't do my job. I can't do my job, other people can't do their job, and at the end of the day, who gets hurt? The client and the patient. And so I think that's really important for us to have interdisciplinary and uh, interprofessional care, but also the importance of having a central hub where we know that it's a safe place, that if it's not a safe place, we can get everyone on board, not just one part here, one part there, and scatter it. And then that just takes a long time and takes a lot of resources. Did you want to? Okay, the microphone is, is here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to wrap this um, up so that we have a, a sense of where we are and then open it to the group for questions. There, there are common threads that have come up in all of the panelists' remarks. And one is we're talking about comfort. and. Um, patient-centered experience. And so it goes from, the, in fact, you know, just thinking of my own experience, the, the day that I was having this particular procedure, um, I took a friend with me. My partner was out of town. And um, we were worried about whether or not she looked too butch because we didn't want to make the providers uncomfortable. And, and I remember being aware of am I too butch is she too butch are we look you know do they you know are they are they going to treat us weird or are they going to think of us weird um, and I always you know like we're not together <laughs> so I do a lot of extra work and I know our patients do a lot of extra work trying to not have discomfort and so there's that 
comfort and discomfort on everybody's part, it's a ripple effect, all the way over to feeling um, like it's not safe uh, as, and, and being traumatized. And so everything in between, like what do I wear? Is this not appropriate? Do I dress in a way that I'm most comfortable in order to have providers feel more comfortable with me and to get the best care? And then there's knowledge. The next thread is knowledge and skill uh, and how we're trained as professionals and, and having this extra burden of, I don't, I don't feel competent in this area. I, um, I want to be, I want to say the right things. I want to do the right things. And then feeling bad if we don't feel like we're on top of it. And then there is the interprofessional component of we're all trained in our own little way. We're all trained, we talk about silos. And then we're supposed to be competent in how we work with each other because we all have slightly different language. And so if you listen to people who come from psychology, we talk a little bit differently than people who come from medicine or dentistry or public health or care coordination and on and on and on. And we have to find a way to come together in a hub and provide care and provide access to care. And so every layer of this brings more complexity and uh, can be a little bit more challenging, but ultimately um, incredibly rewarding. And so I'm looking at Chaz. Should we move to questions from the group? Do you need a microphone? Did anybody want to? Um, so I had a question. Um, I'm a dental student, and I know in dentistry that in private practice you'll often refer out um, like root canals or oral surgery cases. And I know that you can create a hub within your own practice, um, but what, I guess what would you guys recommend if say you referred somebody out to somebody you thought was LGBT friendly but you weren't sure yet? and they came back with a very bad experience. I mean, in a professional way, what is the best way to handle that is, because you don't really necessarily want to cut all ties and start burning bridges, but at the same time, you don't want to be sending patients to an unsafe place where they could be re-traumatized. And I mean, would it be professional to maybe suggest training? Or, I mean, I'm just not sure how you would go about handling that. Wants to field that, we have my microphone here. All the microphones at the table work too for the audience. You just have to press on the button. So, uh, I'll. Can you hear me? Yay! I'll just I'll just start. Um, again, it's when I refer someone, it's an extension of me, and so I do try very very hard to find people who are similar philosophy of me. And your question's good, Julia. It's hard. It's difficult because there's there's my first re first reaction was I won't refer again, and that is that's that's one reaction, and it uh, and it depends. And I do think of a specific incident where I spoke to an oral surgeon, and I was comfortable with the person, and it was actually a wonderful conversation. It was opening, and things changed in this person's point of view changed but it, that's a difficult and probably not the best answer but there might be a time that I would not refer that's that's just me guys so so this has happened um, for me with my own clients but I'm in a mental health um, field so it's a little bit different um, so when my client has came back with a really crappy experience, so if I'm ex um, referring them out to a medical provider for, say, hormones, and I have, in a way, heard good things. So, for example, 
if I refer someone out who is a non-binary um, trans person to an uh, endocrinologist that I have heard good things from, from binary folks, I might add a caveat, like, this might be something to look out for. Let's process this. How can we help you cope better if something does come up? And if something bad does come up, I will ask them, like, how do you want me how, to support you in this? Do you, would you like me to advocate for you outside of this? Do you want me to talk to them? Um, personally, uh, or do you want me to just say, in general, I have heard interesting things from the community about your practice, let's have a conversation. So it's not necessarily putting the client or the patient um, on the spotlight and say, you make the decision for everyone in the community. More of how can I support you in this process, but also how best can I support the community in this process? Uh, and whether or not it's talk going to that person and say, hey, you did some pretty crappy things. Let's have a conversation. Let's um, try to figure out what went wrong so we can learn from it. Maybe it's training. Maybe it's not. Maybe something's a little bit more. And if that doesn't work, then at the end of the day, maybe that's not the right person to refer to. But in such a small town, and especially rural towns, you don't have that option. So then what do you do? What, what do you uh, compromise on? And this is where it's important to have Going back to like the central hub, we should, if we have a central hub, we at least have some knowledge of one place in this state or in this region that we can go to for consultation, resources, support, or even care. Your, your point is a good one. Um, I think one of the comments is if we think about patient-centered care and going back to the patient and saying, hmm, okay, how much do you want me as a provider to be involved? Do you want me? to have the conversation? Do you prefer that you have the conversation? Is this something we could do together? Even though I know that time is like crazy, you know, short. Um, as a behavioral health person who actually works in a clinic, sometimes behavioral health can help um, go with people to the, the point going with, meaning on the phone or whatever it is. But the patients, different patients are going to be different. And so going back to that centered, empathic view of how do you want us to be involved? How can we help you best navigate this um, is always helpful. And then it's never going to be perfect. So questions? The one in the back. Do you have the microphone there? Is this working? Yay. Yeah. Oh, that's awful. Um, so I don't know if it's a question that everyone's going to be able to answer, but I was interested in how you all might incorporate sex positivity into your practice in clinical, cl clinical care. It seems oftentimes that, you know, people are able to say, okay, I'm gay, I'm trans, and you can put it down on a document, but when it comes down to actually asking questions about sexual histories and activities, it doesn't happen. Um, as a queer man who was looking for a primary care, when that doctor actually asked me about my sexual history, I was almost taken aback by it and confused by it because for so long that was not a part of my medical experience. So I didn't know if you all had any kind of tips or, or information on how you might incorporate ideas of sex positivity into your practice. Can you hear me? Okay. So if you're a first year medical student, in about two weeks, you'll, you can come to my lecture <laughs> and I will be talking a little bit about taking a sexual history. And I think one of the things is, um, as a provider, trying to normalize taking a sexual history is an important thing. Um, I think normalizing any topic for patients often makes it okay for them to, to give you more information. Um, so I think the way that as a provider you can do this in a simple way is to just make it normal to take a sexual history. So tell people, you know, once a year when you come in for physical, I take a sexual history on my patients. Um, I think one thing I've encountered, particularly with my trans or queer patients, is that they've run into situations where people have asked them out of curiosity about certain things rather than feeling like this is part of an important part of your medical history. And so that's something that I would caution people to avoid just asking out of curiosity, but trying to make that part of everyone's medical history at some point um, during routine medical care is really important. Or, I'm sorry, can I just add? And, but also um, add to it that um, acknowledge that it can be an uncomfortable conversation for some trans and queer conversation, but this is a purpose for it, that you know, these questions has a purpose in the medical history. 
Uh, and so to collaborate with the client uh, and the patient with that, like, I'm about to ask some pretty personal questions. Are you okay with that? I second that, yes. Getting their permission as well. So saying, yes, I do this for all of my patients, but is this okay that we talk about this? But I also think that it's a systemic issue because um, sex is such a still such a taboo topic in our society in general. So we can start uh, targeting that at a systemic level, level and not just in the medical and mental health um, field, then that's where the change actually happens. Yeah, I totally agree. We we take we talk about sexual practices and history continuously in our office. Um, it's something we do since we do HIV care. Um, it, it's also being non-judgmental. You really don't know what clients are going to tell you what their sexual practices are. You know, you don't want your eyes to go this big when someone tells you a particular practice that they're that they are you doing. And so, you it, it's the normalization, like you talked about earlier. Normalization is really important, and being non-judgmental. Um, we hear all sorts of things, and you just have to make sure that you you take that in stride and you are and, and be comfortable with it. Because when you're uncomfortable, then your client, your patient will sense that and will not be truthful with you. And then you actually are, your sexual history is not even going to be accurate then. I was kind of confused by um, the question exactly because when you come to the doctor, you have to ask about a sexual history. And I respect everybody, but when the patient comes in the room, I don't gear the screening questions towards, quote, unquote, how they may identify sexually. I screen it towards what anatomy you have, you know. So uh, I don't want to make anybody feel uncomfortable, but you still have to base your physical exam and your questions as quote unquote standard on what anatomy they have and sexual history, not so much to f be nosy, but to find out what you can screen for, what should you be screening for? Do you want to address this? Um, I think the, the important thing I will say in a sense that's correct and incorrect. I think the important thing is to ask questions in an inclusive and universal manner. So there's a few things you can do like mirroring the language that your patient comes in with. So if someone tells me that they're queer, I am going to refer to them as queer if that's the language that they prefer. Um, the other thing is, is asking questions about sexual partners rather than presuming that someone may have an opposite sex partner. Um, so the manner in which you're asking questions can be much more inclusive. Um, certainly when it comes to symptoms, anatomy may be important. Often people will come in with certain, um, certain symptoms that they would have to describe. But when it comes to screening or just taking a sexual history, I would not start with questions about what type of anatomy do you have. I would, I would try to make things more inclusive as far as um, what's, who are your partners, um, what sorts of um, sexual practices do you have, what sorts of prevention do you have either for pregnancy prevention or preventing sexually transmitted infections, and asking open-ended questions rather than um, the narrowed questions that may be more biased than we think um, is really important. And when it comes to anatomy, that anatomy can be very triggering and dysphoric for trans folks. And so if we're not uh, approaching how we discuss a person's body in, in terms of anatomy, you know, that can create a lot of dysphoria and a lot of um, trauma for that person. So kind of going back to what you were saying, how do we ask questions in a respectful manner, right? How do we mirror their language? What do they call their anatomy? We are understanding is very a biological understanding. But if you if you look at cultures, the the biological aspect and the cultural aspect, there's two different constructs. So we have to go we have to meet the patient where they are and where how they call their anatomy. And so we can still have a basic understanding of what that anatomy might look like, but in terms of mirroring the language, it creates an inclusivity that I am, I see you, 
and I see your experiences, and I want to respect that. Let's do this together. And we can't do that. We're using two different languages to refer to the same thing, and that creates a very big riff between you and the you as a provider and the client and the patient. Anybody else? Uh, I think we have to wrap up here. Um, I have we have four minutes. So any we could probably take one more question. Yes, can you get your microphone there? Okay. There's been hints about uh, a possible clinic that would be inclusive and um, that would encompass lots of different areas of um, expertise. Is that something that's in the works? Anybody? Anybody? Yeah. I wish I could tell you that with d definitive answer. The, the answer now is that there's definitely discussions about what that would look like and the road ahead, but there is nothing definitive at this time that I am aware of. The, go ahead. And if anyone's interested in being involved in those discussions, please feel free to grab me or talk with me afterwards. Any other questions? Any last minute Speak questions? on that, the, um, the, what the future brings. Um, I'm with University of Louisville Physicians. Um, and uh, we have 700 providers all um, are working with patients throughout the Louisville area. And there are many groups that are extremely interested in putting together um, a clinic. Um, of course, that's going to take a lot of steps. So the first step is to get people more sensitive and more um, educated in treating patients within the current clinics. And then hopefully moving forward to have, you know, a true clinic that we're pulling people together. So. Thank you. You have to there's a button there, press, and you'll see Got it. There you hey, go. thank you. I, I just, I'm retired, but I was in the administration for years and years, and I would like to just advocate anyone who is interested in being a provider to step forward and, and make that known, because the reality is there is a cost involved. Uh, that's a, it's a legitimate cost, and uh, uh, your willingness to be involved uh, could be helpful in uh, letting uh, people who are in charge of making a lot of decisions, including the financial ones, uh, know that. So I just encourage it. This has been a fantastic <laughs> session. Thank you. Thank you. That's a perfect lead-in. I want to thank the panel members. Um, it's been extraordinary and an honor to be here today with you. Um, thank you for attending. Um, so a round of applause for them. Thank you. I, I'm instructed to do some housekeeping. Remember, to uh, if you, you have to do a sign-in procedure, the clipboard is being displayed for you at the back of the room. And so you need to do that to get credit. Also, uh, be sure to uh, give your evaluation. Who do they give the evaluation to? Okay. Um, be sure to give the evaluation to someone before you leave. And thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.